She taught Aubrey how to make jam this uh, this weekend, so I probably gained a few more pounds. So thank you for that, Lauren. Um, sacrifice. Sacrifice. Yes, Cody. Um, but if you want to give to the Ministry of Fit online, you can. Um, it's secure, and it's www.fitcommunity.church. Me and Auburn practiced this last night, so I wouldn't get the dots. <laughs> we could not be here without your generosity, so thank all of you that partnered with this ministry. It's time to read our mission statement together. Um, Fit Community Church exists to lead people into faithful, intentional and trusting relationships with Jesus Christ. So everything that we do here today is meant to fulfill that mission. In just a few minutes, we will enter our time of worship. Um, but before we do that, I just want to tell everybody here that we're a little bit different. Um, we don't wait for the Lord to speak to you. If, if you need to come down, these, these steps are always open for you to kneel and pray for uh, repentance, um, if you need to get a burden out, um, they're always open. Feel free to come down at any point in the service and pray. If the Lord speaks to you, don't don't put that off. Just just do it and 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 be obedient. I just want to. Just thank everybody for being here today. It's, it's just good to see you. And, and before we start our, our service today, let's bow our heads and, and pray. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father God, just thank you for the, the sunshine and the beautiful day that you've given us today. Thank you for all these people that put you first and, came, and have came to your house to, to worship you, Lord. I pray that everybody will put their thoughts and burdens or what their plans are today or what their burdens are at work or whatnot, all for the next hour, Lord, and just pray that we would open our hearts and, and minds to, to take in the message that Pastor Brad has given us. As we sing these songs of praise, Lord, I just pray that we would just make a, a joyful noise, Lord, and just always be thankful for what you've done by sending your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ to die for our sin and be resurrected, Lord, so that we can have a relationship with you and have hope in the kingdom of heaven, Lord, when, when we pass from this earth. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet today, church. Come on, if you're able today.
evidence of an almighty God standing all around us. From the sun in the sky, from the moon at night, from your life's testimony, see the evidence of his faithfulness all around us. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The wind storms make way for spring in every season. In every season, from where.
And if you'll go to him each and every day, just give him the glory and the thanks for all that he's done. It'll change your heart. It'll change your mind. It'll prepare your soul for a better place, a place that's in glory. So this morning as we sing this worship song, let's all give him the glory today. Amen. Oh 
sunshine. To God be the glory. We just ask you, Lord, to bless this service and open our hearts to receive this message. Amen. Why don't you high five about five people before you sit down? Did you take a seat? they were in at the time. 
And little did they know back in Isaiah's day that it would be Roman oppression and Roman rule that the Messiah would free them from. But we know today because we have the Bible and we have historians and theologians that have told us that Jesus Christ came not to lead a military conquest, but he came to bring a spiritual revival. And through spiritual revival, we have seen lives changed. We've seen people saved. We've seen churches planted all over the world. And we see that still happening today. But here's what happens when you get to the New Testament. We start looking forward to the future again. As Isaiah had prophesied that Jesus would come, he did. He lived on this earth. He had a ministry that lasted approximately three years, approximately a thousand days. And in that thousand days, he turned the entire world upside down. He changed life as we know it. He changed missions as we know it. He sent people into the world to change the world. And then he was crucified. And everyone thought it was over. They thought the great teacher, the great master carpenter that he was, the, the one who claimed to be the son of God, we literally watched him hang on an old rugged cross. We watched him bleed. We watched the Roman soldier stab him in the side to make sure that he was really dead. And then they buried him in the tomb. And everyone thought that was it. The story was over. But little did anybody know at that time that God was doing a new thing even in the grave. Amen. God had a plan even in the grave. God was doing a work while Jesus was in the grave preparing the world for what would be to come next. This new thing. And then on the third day the stone was rolled away and Jesus Christ emerged from the tomb and he all of a sudden was resurrected and people saw it. It's not that we believe necessarily um, in, that he was dead. We understand death. But they literally saw the resurrected Jesus Christ before he ascended into heaven. Amen. And then another new thing came. The power of the Holy Spirit. As Jesus ascended into heaven, Jesus said, I must go away because something better is coming. There's a new thing coming. You may know what it is. We may teach on this in the month of July, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But this new thing would be the advocate, the Holy Spirit, not dwelling in a book, not walking in just one man, but dwelling inside of all men, women, and children that we call Jesus Lord. Through repentant hearts, the power of the Savior entered into the world. And then God said, but yet there's going to be another new thing coming. And in the book of Revelation, we know we've been through all of Jesus' life. We've seen the Apostle Paul in August. We're going to start the entire book of Acts. A, a, I don't know how long that teaching series is going to take. Forever, probably. But I promise you it's going to transform this church. It's going to transform the way you think. So all the missionary journeys are over. All of the praying is over. We get to the book of Revelation. The rapture happens. It's new. We talk about it all the time. We wait on it. It's a new thing. And then when the rapture happens, the church is going to be raptured. They're going to be called up into God's presence. There are going to be two people in a vehicle. One's going to be driving. One's going to be riding. When the rapture happens, one's going to be called up and one's going to be left behind. Our prayer is they would both be called up. But in the instance that's not the case, you would hate to be the one in the passenger seat. Amen. There's going to be airplanes literally flying across the world. Business is going to be going on as usual, just as it was in Noah's day. And the rapture is going to happen, and people are going to be raptured from the airplane into the presence of Almighty God, and the pilot's going to be gone, and all chaos is going to break loose. That's a possibility. And here's a really sobering thought and possibility. When the rapture happens, say it happened this morning on Sunday morning right here in good old Fifth Church, Roxburgh, North Carolina, or wherever you're watching from today. The rapture happens and then half the church is called up and the other half stays behind. It's a possibility. Here's the question. Do you know which half you're in? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are one of the called, one of the chosen? Are you walking with the Lord? Are you dreading the day of the rapture or are you looking forward to it? Because nonetheless, either way, it's 
coming. It's on its way. And then all throughout Revelation, we have the letters to the, to the churches and we have all the judgments that are poured out. We have the Antichrist who comes on the scene. We have the great beast that comes out of the sea. We have all of that that goes on. Listen, I don't know what this means. Just think about it. You're going to have to make a decision whether or not you take the mark of the beast or whether or not you reject it and accept Christ. And for all those who are left behind, that choice is going to be theirs to make. Do we accept the mark of the beast so that we can eat? So that we can trade goods, so that we can be in society with everybody else. Think about that for a minute. Or, or, do we risk our lives and say, not today, devil. I'm not taking the mark 666 on my forehead or chip in my arm, whatever it looks like when the time comes. Because I'm a follower of Jesus and to live is Christ, to die is gain. Somebody shout amen. Come on. Man. All of that happens. And then we move all the way to the end. At the end of the seven year tribulation period. And then we see something amazing happen. A new thing. A new thing. And the world's going to be completely changed. And there's going to be a 1,000 year millennial reign on this earth. Where the saints of Christ are going to rule and reign with him on this earth. And that's not the message today. That would take me a day or two to get through the millennial time. But then we get beyond the millennial time. The 1,000 years is now over. And the Bible tells us, you can go back and read it, that the devil, Satan, is going to be released from his chains for a short period of time. And once he's released, he's going to wreak havoc again for a short time, right before he's thrown into the eternal lake of fire. And then we get to Revelation chapter 21. If you have your Bible, Revelation 21, I'm just going to, we're going to walk verse by verse through this thing, almost word by word, so track with me if you will. But what I, do, what I don't want you to do is tune out, because this might be the most important one we do all year. Because as far as we know, the rapture could happen in the next 30 minutes. Amen. And if that happens, and this is the last message we hear, and this is the last decision we make, we want to make sure it's the right decision before we leave this place. Amen? Amen. Revelation 21, verse number 1. This is John the Revelator. I like to call him John the Revelator. I used to sing this song called John the Revelator. It was a, I can't, I don't forget the word. <laughs> This same John who was given one revelation of Jesus Christ. The whole book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus given to John about events that are definitely coming in the future. Right? So he's, gonna, he's revealing all this to him. So John is on the Isle of Patmos, which is really outside of to a modern day Turkey today. You can go there and, and, and visit if you'd like. But this is John and he's got a captive audience. Well, the Lord has a captive audience in John. And he tells him to write this down. And earlier in the book of Revelation, it said that it's a blessing for those people who read this word. So that's what we're doing today. How many of y'all want to be blessed today? Amen. Just three. How many more of y'all want to be blessed today? Amen. There we go. Amen. John, this is, the, this is what the Lord gives him. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. See, there's going to come a time when we get to this point that what we see here is no longer going to be. That the earth that you know it as, that, that supplies you with all of your oxygen, your water, your nutrients, your minerals, your protons, your neutrons, none of that mess is going to matter anymore. That's all great and fascinating things. But there's going to be a new earth. There's going to be something entirely different here. There's also going to be a new heaven. If you go outside and you look into the sky, you're literally looking into the heavens, right? You can see God's glory, His majesty all through the heavens. Sometimes during the day it's super bright, but go do it at night. Go look at the stars in the sky and just think for a moment that your God, the creator of you, created that as well. And think about how he did it. In, in that short six-day time period, he created all these things. And in one breath, he's going to create a new earth and a new heaven. And here's the cool thing. You get to experience both at that point in time. 
You get to experience both. Right now, we don't get to experience heaven with God. Although we have his presence living inside of us, there is coming a day where it is literally going to be all combined into one. A new heaven and a new earth. And the sea will not exist anymore. If you go back into the beginning of time, there used to not be a sea. There was land masses. And then one day, God divided the land mass. And he made waters to separate the people. And he put us in the far corners and the far reaches of the earth. And at the last, at this new heaven and this new earth, there's coming a day where we will be able to freely get wherever we're going. There will be no impediments. There will be no roadblocks. There will be no reason to be socially distanced or disconnected. Because you will be in the presence of of the Lord in a new heaven in a new earth and then watch this and I saw verse 2 the holy city new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband you can go to Jerusalem today the Bible speaks of a new Jerusalem coming it's going to be the center of everything it's going to be where our God resides. It's going to be where Jesus is. And it's going to be where everybody is migrating to, where we're going to want to be. The cities like New York, California, all of those, any city, they no longer mean anything. The only thing that matters is the new Jerusalem where Jesus is. We were singing this song earlier, and it just made me think about it. This is a sobering thought, but it goes a little something like this. What a day. When my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. We will honestly, we will be where he is. And what I said earlier about that song, not everybody's going to have that same experience. Some people, when we sing that song, we say it's going to be a glorious day. The Bible tells us that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess one day before the Lord. And some people are not going to be singing that song because they didn't do what God was calling them to do while they were here. They're not going to experience this new Jerusalem. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But for you, for me, for the ones who are risen in Christ, for the dead that has been risen, for the souls that have been reunited with a, with a heavenly body, with this new presence, we get to stand face to face with our Lord, Jesus Christ. And we're no longer having need for the Holy Spirit. We'll be with the Holy God. And we'll walk with Him. And we'll talk with Him. He'll probably tell us things that we've had questions about. Anybody got questions for God? I believe one day we get there and he'll answer them. As best as he sees fit to answer them. Some questions don't need to be answered. It's kind of irrelevant. I want you to think about this for a minute. He says, The new Jerusalem's coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I was thinking about that verse right there. I remember my wedding day. I've been reminiscing a little bit this past week because I was at a beautiful wedding. Garrett and Emily are back from their honeymoon. Um, and we were at a, at a wedding, their wedding this past Sunday. And it, it was an awesome time. I mean, God was in that place. And then I remember my wedding. I got thinking about it. And I stood up there at the front. Garrett, like you, I stood up there with the preacher and uh, the groomsmen. And we're all down there. And man, when they started playing that song and Jamie walked through that door, I'm telling you, my heart did a backflip. I saw her coming down. She had on that white dress and she made her way all the way down to where I was and then she took me by the hand and we were looking at each other. Her parents finally gave her away. I was like, it's about time. But if I had a picture, I would put it on the screen, but it would have embarrassed her and I'd have got in trouble later. But she was a beautiful bride. She was adorned for the occasion. 
She was there for a specific reason, to be united with her groom. As New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven from God, we could also interchange New Jerusalem with the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the church. The church is the, don't miss this, I need you to write this down somewhere in your Bible, don't forget it. The church is the bride of Christ. New Jerusalem comes down adorned as a bride for the groom. You and I today are the bride of Christ. The church universal, the church that believes in Jesus is the bride of Christ. Let me ask you a question. Because I get this debate a lot. And don't raise your hand, but you ever heard somebody say this, I, I don't have to go to church. I don't have to go to church to have a relationship with Jesus. I don't have to be there on Sundays or Wednesdays. It's really not that important a thing. Matter of fact, church is, for the most part, full of hypocrites and liars and cheaters and drug addicts and alcoholics and um, hypocrites. Did I already say hypocrites? If not, tell the person next to you, say, full of hypocrites, right? But it's full of all, all of these, all of these People and I just don't see any reason in the world why I need to be there up in the middle of all of that. Now let me ask this question. If I married my wife, we had an awesome wedding, an amazing honeymoon in Mexico. Sunsets were beautiful. And then I come back home, and we started building our life together, and she never came to see me anymore. She went off to work one day, and she called me on my cell phone. And she said this, she said, man, I love you, but I don't want to be with you. I love you, but I'm going to be over here, and you be over there. And every once in a while, we might get together and talk. But for the most part, I really don't want to have anything to do. How long do you think we'd stay married if that happened? And that's the disconnection today. See, the church isn't about the building. And it isn't about the people. It's about what God's doing in this building through these people. Amen. It's the universal principle that I don't care if you're an alcoholic, a drug addict, a homosexual, uh, an atheist, a Muslim, a witchcraft practicing Harry Potter, whatever you want to call yourself, God does not discriminate against salvation. He will save any and every person who calls out on the name of the Lord and says, I surrender my life, Lord Jesus, because you surrendered yours for me. Would you wash me clean? Would you make me yours? Amen. And he never leaves. We are the bride of Christ. I don't want you to think about church as just somewhere you go. It's who you are. It's who you are. You are. Listen to what happens next. I gotta move on. Verse 3. John the Revelator said, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, there's that word again that Isaiah used. Behold, it happens so many times throughout the Bible because God is trying to get our attention. Behold, stop, look, listen. The dwelling place of God is with man. It means we're gonna be together. It means he is here. He is in our presence. He is our God. He is our Father. He is our friend. He is our provider. He is Jireh, holy Jireh. Oh, my goodness. Can we preach today? He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And why in the world would we not want to be in his presence? I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. There will be no more little gods, no more little G-gods, right? Money will no longer be a God. Cars will no longer be a God. Idolatry will no longer exist. We will be in the presence of the Almighty. And, he, and we will be his people. Can you imagine? Like, we think we're his people right now. And we got it blessed, right? Like, we got blessings coming in. I got blessings on top of blessings. And, and all of these things just keep happening. And then you see God working. And God's like, you ain't seen nothing yet. You just hang on a minute. I'm going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And I'm coming to be with you. And I'm going to close the chasm. It'll no longer be a wide chasm. It'll be closed. You can walk to me. You can talk with me. I am your friend. 
Just a closer walk, Jesus said. I'm going to be right there with you. We'll be his people. We'll really be his people then. And God will be our God. And then here's something amazing he's going to do. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Man, we've done some crying in 2020 and 2021, haven't we? We've lost some loved ones. We've lost some jobs. And we've had some good tears as well. But we won't even need the good tears anymore because he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. All those that are going to experience the second death, you know, there's a first death. You, you die and then you have to uh, go and stand before Lord Jesus. If you experience the second death, well, you end up with the same fate as Satan with an eternity in the lake of fire with weeping and gnashing of teeth. But you will no longer have to worry about this death because death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. We don't have to think about what happens in the past anymore. I believe, this is what I believe. I believe God's going to take the memory away Amen. of the hurt. But I also believe that he's such a gracious and a, and a good God that those things that he blessed you with, we won't forget those things, but those things where we had sin in our life, where we rebelled against God, where we paid the consequences, where we saw sin run havoc in our lives and our family's lives, that memory is going to be a waste because that sin has already, if you remember this, been tossed as far as the what? The east is to the west and no man can see that and he never brings it back to remembrance. We get to experience something completely new. He's doing a new thing. All the former things have passed away. Verse 5. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. I think that's put in there for extra emphasis. So that we understand that the book of Revelation, Jesus' revelation is given to John, who is also the gospel writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He also wrote John 1, John 2, John 3, later on in the New Testament. He's saying that so that we pay special attention and never forget it. God is not the author of confusion. He is the giver of life. God's not going to mince words. He's not going to say things that trip us up. He's going to teach in parables. But when, this is how Jesus taught when he was here. But when you have the scales removed from your eyes, the parables start to make sense. When we start to see God for who he is as an all-magnificent, all-knowing, omniscient, omnipresent, king of the world, creator of all things. When he says, I am making all things new, that includes you too. Somebody shout Amen. And then in verse 6, and he said to me, it is done. It is done. Like, this Bible is about to come to an end. There's one more. There's chapter 22 talking about the river of life. But when God says it is finished, it is finished, isn't it? <laughs> Let's back up. up to his father and he said it is finished and his time was because God was about to do a new thing and in all this time thousands and thousands of possibly thousands more years are going to pass by and then God gives the same words to John he says it is done is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. Do you know how he can say that? It's because the payment's already been made. The check has already cleared the bank. His name was Jesus. He paid the sin penalty price so that we could walk in freedom. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Amen? So that we can have freedom, everlasting, eternal life. No payment required Amen. to receive the water of life. I'm grateful I ain't going to need no more gallons of water from Food Line when I get to heaven. How about y'all? 
Like, I don't even have it up here. I walk around with a gallon of water every day and look like a fool, I'm quite sure. And I ain't going to need to do that anymore. Because I'm going to have the water of life flowing through my eternal veins. And I don't think my blood's going to run red anymore. I think it's just going to, I don't know what it's going to look like, to be honest. Because my blood's going to match Jesus' blood. And when Jesus already poured out his blood for me, so God infused him with something brand new. I'm going to get something new. You're going to get something new. We are going to be where God is. Verse 7, this is how you do it. The one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God and he will be my son. Here's a question for today. Are you ready to step up and conquer the sin that's keeping you from that relationship with God? Are you ready to say, I am done living this old way because I feel the presence of God pulling me into a new way? Those old sins that keep resurfacing. He says, for those who conquer, for those who conquer will have the heritage. We will be called sons and daughters of Almighty God. There's one more thing i got to tell you and we're going to be done. In verse number 8. I was going to stop at verse 7, but I don't think that's fair. Because somebody here today, I believe, needs to hear verse number 8. Because this is where we are. This is maybe where you are. And these are something that you need to conquer and overcome. Let me just read it. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, Sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And that's where we have something to wrestle with. there's undoubtedly friends and family who fall into one of those categories in verse number 8. Quite possibly that's you. And this is the question. Are you willing to risk it? Are you willing to risk whether or not God is telling the truth? fire and sulfur, which is the second death in the lake of fire. I don't think God sent you here today to leave here the same way you came. You might not be all of those things, but we're all one of them. Every one of us has a choice to make. You see, even saved people but I don't want you to think you're getting off the hook that easy this morning, because neither am I. Because there's been times in my life I've fallen into those categories. I hadn't physically murdered anybody lately. <laughs> you ever heard old saying it's the thought that counts? loves you so much. He doesn't desire for anybody to face that. See, that lake of fire was reserved for it's one person. For Satan, who thought he knew as much or more than God and thought he could do what God could do and do it even better. And God said, the devil will know not today. <laughs> and we know his fate is in the lake of here is the most important question I'm ever going to ask you. Do you know what your fate is if you were to die today? With every head bowed, every eye closed, worship team come on. I just wonder today.
Will you let God do a new thing in your life? Will you just be open and honest this morning? We're just going to take a moment and pray. Would you be open and honest this morning and just say, Father, you know, I've been doing this my way for quite a while. And it's just not working. It's just dragging me down further. It's just pulling my life into this darkness, into this depression. It's just ruining my life. lift your hand, allow the presence of God to just come over you at this time. To take away those tears. He's already promised that I will take away the tears, I will take away the pain, the heartache. I will make you a new person. I will give you brand new life. There's nothing that you have to worry about. I will do this for you. But here's the key. You've got to ask Him to do it. You've got to ask Him to Every head bowed and every eye closed right now. Will you just talk to God for a moment? Say, God, I've been wrestling with this sin in my life. And I didn't know how to get rid of it. I didn't know how to turn from it. And right now, as God is speaking to you, simply have to say, God, forgive me of my sin. Make me new. I want to be a child of God today. Would you free me from these chains that surround me? And here's what God will do for you right now in this moment. The Holy Spirit will wash over you if it hasn't already been happening in the last 30 minutes. And you'll feel this thumping in your chest that's your heart beating kind of fast because you're feeling not complete. And as he's calling you out of your sin, he's asking you to do something really specific. And only you know what that is. But here's what I want to challenge you to do. Don't reject him this morning as he calls. Everybody looking around, if you feel the presence of God in your life right now, maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time, would you just slip your hand up? Nobody's looking. Maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time. Amen. Right over here. God bless you. Amen. Right over here. Anybody else? Come on. I know God is speaking to somebody today. God, right over here. God bless you. Right over here. Thank you. Anybody else today? Do you feel the presence of God in your life? I don't know if it's of your first time, if it's your first time, or you've just been such a guilty distance. You've not felt his calling in so long. Just lift your hands today and surrender in freedom right back there, brother. God bless you. Thank you. Just in freedom, God, free me from the chains of addiction. Free me from the chains of depression. Free me from the sin that holds me down. If you need freedom today, just lift your hands. Come on, church. Just lift your hands in freedom right over here. Amen. Right here. Yes, God bless you. Come on, if you need the Lord to do a work in your life, to pull you out of that old way and to set you on a new course, a new life, a new path, just lift your hand right now. Say, God, I am yours. Use me as you would see fit to use me today. If you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you just ask Him to be yours right now? I don't, I don't know how to emphasize this enough. See, I had already asked him to be my Lord and Savior. And I still wasn't living for him. I still wasn't doing what he called me to do. I still was being disobedient. I was just like the church at Laodicea. You can read about it in Revelation. I was a lukewarm Christian. Straddling the fence between the world and heaven. And one day God rocked my world. And on that day, he almost invited my daughter to come home and be with her heavenly father. 
no matter how much I tried or how much I cried or my wife cried in the parking lot where we almost lost her, we had no control over the situation. We were as helpless as little babies crying out for the mom or the daddy. And in that moment, I said, God, I surrender all. From this day forward, whatever you say is what we will do. For some reason, maybe it was for today, God let us keep joy. But here's what I know to be true. There's going to be somebody called home to the Lord today. Well, I'm confident that Julia is a child of God now. I want to make sure you leave here with that same confidence. I want you to leave here today with your heart set on fire, with your life aglow, shouting, Great are you, Lord! Thank you, Almighty Lord, for changing me, for saving me, for making me brand new. While we sing, I want you to stand up from where you are. And walk right down here. Everybody's going to stand together. But what you're going to do, you're simply going to step out on faith. As the Lord pulls you, as the Lord moves you from a place of complacency, a place where you are comfortable in your sin, you are simply going to stand up. And we're going to do like we do on Wednesday nights. We're going to flood this altar if the Lord moves. Matter of fact, Lauren, go to that side. Cody, go to that side. Jamie, come right over here. Miss Judy will be happy to pray for you. We can pray with you, for you, or you can just cry out to God. But I urge you with everything that I got in me today, if you believe the words that we just read in Revelation chapter 21, there's something you need to do with God right now. Every one of us in this room have a reason to come and talk with our Savior. If you choose not to, may God bless you anyway. But God blesses those who are obedient to his cause. So whatever you need today, I urge you, come and make peace with the God who loves you. Just talk to God for a minute with every head bowed, every eye closed. Would you all stand to your feet, please? Would you come down and talk to God this morning? Let one of our prayer team just pray with you. And ask God to give you new life. In Jesus' name.
can just play a little bit of that since you were doing it. God, if we prepare to leave today, I pray you would send us out of here with a fresh spirit. Understanding and knowing completely that you are the giver of life. You give the water of life. You are our all in all. Because you paid it all. For those who made decisions here today, please do not keep those decisions to yourself. If today is the first day you've chosen to walk with the Lord, we praise God for you. If today is, is your day that you came back from that guilty distance, wherever you were, you just like the prodigal son or daughter, you just thought there were greener pastures. But I want you to know today that God's arms are open wide. And he will take you just as you are. He will wrap his best robe around you. He will give you the feast of the farm. He will give you the kings, the keys to eternity. One day, in the new heaven and the new earth, you will experience God like you've never experienced Him before. Father, I thank you today. You have met with us in your house. God, I thank you today that you loved us. You gave us, you gave us this opportunity to worship, to praise, to say, "Great are you, Lord." God, until we meet again, I pray that we take your message into the streets, the highways, and the byways. That our mission will be your mission. To see a world changed for Christ. To see champions raised up. To see people to become more than conquerors. God, may sin hit the floor as our praises rise. To you, Almighty Lord. We thank you. We love you. Give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people shout and praise.